We carry on with the preserved tablets, part three, and we are still dealing with some parts of the Quran that they are used today and greatly by people to prove that everything Allah, uh, that Allah has already written what's going to happen to us and that we are just following what has been written. But before carry on with this ayah which states that وَمَا مِنْ غَائِبَةٍ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ And there is nothing that is hidden be that in the heaven or the earth إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ except that it is recorded in a clear book. But I want to tell you first about the story of a man aged 26. He is Egyptian and uh, this man was caught in 2006 after him sodomizing and raping 12 children and then killing those kids. This man is, is, is a real monster. It, for some time, about three years, it created a havoc in Egypt, a really a real terror because uh, from now and then they would hear that a child has been found. And how they found about these kids is that uh, some men who work in an underground in Cairo, in Shubr al Khaima, if you know uh, Cairo, and they found the remains of bones from kids, of children uh, under the train. And that's when they realized that something was, and uh, from that the story went on until the police caught one of the three because there were three members, uh, the turbulence or the turbine man and then he had two accomplices both accomplices were very young 15 and 17 and this man was 26 years of age the 26 years of age married a girl aged 12 in an Orfi marriage. Orfi marriage is when you just marry Islamically, so to speak, okay? And uh, she used him to use girls of 12 years of age, and of course he would first abuse them sexually, and then he would push them into prostitution. This is not happening in the United States. This is happening in Egypt. And Egypt, you know, Al-Azhar, and how Egypt is always portrayed as one of the great countries parallel to Saudi Arabia. There is a competition between them too about who is the leader in the Muslim world. So this is happening in a Muslim environment when this gentleman has heard talks and he has and he went and fasted and attended masjid and all that kind of stuff. But on the other side, he was a serial rapist, a serial killer. He would take the kids and then, this is like the peculiar thing, the strange, the, the heart. I don't know how to express it really. He would take the child, the 12 years kid, and then he would lure them uh, in any way he could. You know, those kids did not have parents. These are bastards that live in the streets. They don't have parents. So he would go and, and zoom in on these kids and then he would offer them kind of like, oh, come, I'm gonna, you can spend the night in my place or in my home. I am married. And the child, the poor guy doesn't have where to live. And la ilaha illallah. And how vile the, the government of Egypt and, and, and the people to allow those kids offer to be like that but that's our Muslim world that's why we don't have any real statistics there uh, because it's just because it's they think like if they have statistics it's because it's gonna make them seem evil violent they are evil violent those governments of the Muslim world at large and none is exempted uh, of that uh, thing but you know so this man would lure the kid on a top of a turbine train and the turbine is the first uh, cart or the first car on the train that's the one that they used to drive uh, the train and then he would sodomize the kid on that train because there is a, a portion of that part there that is lower than the rest Egypt is not the, the trains of the United States or England or whatever in Europe England, uh, in Egypt they still run on uh, a 1830s cowboy likes trains so to speak and I've been on those trains and it's peculiar but anyhow and then when he finishes his vile act of rape he would carry the, the kid and waits until the other train coming on the other direction so when the two trains are about to meet guess what he does he throws the kid right in front of the child so that it falls on the rails and the kid is killed instantaneously that's it decapitated in thousand pieces nobody knows about that and that's it bones are and it's gone for until they call him three years four years after he murdered 32 children and then in 2010, he was, uh, he was executed, hang uh, by the rope, and alhamdulillah that he got us rid of that. Now the problem with this is this. For those of us Muslims, those who preach that Allah 
knew everything and then Allah wrote everything that is to happen, then Allah would have written for this man to be the serial killer, the serial rapist, the serial monster that he is. Has Allah really done that? Of course not. Of course not. But the way we preach today, we are accusing Allah directly and this is how it happens. Anywhere in the Quran where you read that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you, uh, this is the translation, in Allah yahdi man yasha, wa yudillu man yasha. Allah guides whom he wills, and doesn't guide whom he doesn't will. So in the books of our tafsir, and as it is preached today, that Allah will guide anyone that Allah wants to guide, and then he will misguide anyone that Allah doesn't misguide. And as you uh, have already spoken about what happened in Japan with the tsunami and the earthquakes and all that kind of stuff, because of that they straight away said, oh Allah hates the Japanese, that's why he gave them the earthquakes, that's why they died, that's why, that's why, that's why. So they link the this, it's, it's atrocious the way the Arabs, especially the Middle East, the Gulf people, how they think is absolutely, I don't know how to really uh, say it without coming vulgar really, but anyhow. So what they say is, Allah guides whom Allah guides. So what they, they say is, when Allah sees in you goodness, he will guide you to Islam. And this is why from the Middle East perspective, especially Saudi Arabia, from their perspective, except if you are Saudi Wahhabi or whatever they want to qualify themselves, Salafi and all that kind of stuff, if you're not following that particular path, you are a misguided, you are an innovator, you're headed to hellfire. And these people really know a little, little less than what they should. They don't study the book of Allah. They are far more interested in what the scholars have said. So the ayah is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying doesn't have to do. That Allah had forced the hand of this man to kill 32, uh, 32 kids, rape them and the way he did. Because on judgment day, this man will come up to Allah and he said, Ya Allah, you wrote that, you coded me to do that, I had no other choice. And he would win an argument against Allah. It's, it's, it's clear, clear, crystal clear. And I don't know why we... Uh, this has created a world of Muslims full of confusions. The least happy people in their religion are Muslims, we the Muslims, and we have to admit to that. See yourself, how many times you really feel that you are happy to be a good, uh, the Muslim that you are. I see a lot of Muslims drinking, fornicating, and, and they have the longest beard possible. But anyhow, let me look at this ayah in Surah an naml 27 and the ayah 75, where Allah says, وَمَا مِنْ غَائِبَةٍ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ And there is nothing that is hidden be that in the heaven or the earth, but is recorded in a clear book. So is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to really everything that you're going to do is already written? Let's see in what context Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, speaks of this. This ayah. In the ayah 71 of the same surah, surah number 27, Allah says, وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And they say, the non-believers, they would say to the believers, when will this promise come to pass? If you are truthful, you, you, they were telling them, when we die, Allah is going to do this, he's going to do that, Allah might punish you. So the non-believers the non were saying, okay, when will this promise come to pass if you are truthful? And then Allah says, Qul. And there we go again with the Qul to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not answer from his own self. He is a messenger, ambassador. He can't formulate things from himself. And then Allah Ta'ala tells him, Qul. Asa an yakuna radifa lakum ba'du alladhi tastajilun. Perhaps what you already are speeding up to happen, expecting or you say it should happen, is in the, in the English ways they always say it's clear, it's near, things like that. But the true meaning that Allah used in Al-Quran is radifa. Radifa is when you see two people on a motorbike and they are riding, there is the driver or the rider of the bike and behind them there is what they call the pillion. The pillion is the person behind the biker. If you are on a horse, there is the horse rider and the person behind the horse rider is called the, the pillion. So here what Allah is telling them, perhaps it already is your pillion i.e. the punishment of Allah either in this life 
or when you die on, on the day of judgment. There is no punishment in the grave. That you can rest assured. That is, you do it today, and then you die, you wait, and then on resurrection day, you go get your book, and then Allah will weigh your actions. You get good, you go to Jannah, you don't get good, you go to punishment, okay? So Allah says, perhaps it already is your pillion, i.e. the punishment of Allah, the promise of Allah is your pillion. It's right behind you, riding on the horse of life. And then Allah says, some of what you have been speeding up. وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى النَّاسِ And your Lord is indeed exceedingly bountiful to mankind. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ Yet, most of the people aren't appreciative of that. وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَا يَعْلَمُ مَا تُكِنُّ صُدُورُهُمْ وَمَا يُعْلِنُونَ And your Lord indeed knows all that their hearts conceal as well as all they externalize. And then Allah says, وَمَا مِنْ خَائِبَةٍ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ And there is nothing that is hidden be it in the heaven or the earth إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ But is collected in a clear book and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَقُصُّ عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ This Qur'an certainly explains to the children of Israel أَكْثَرَ الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ Most of the matters on which they disagree upon. And whatever is hidden on the earth and in the heavens that is not in a clarifying book for it to happen. Allah is speaking about the existence of things and materials, not what humans will do. For example, Allah in that book, clarifying book, Allah knows the names and the, the doings of all viruses that are going to exist until the end of time. Those we know today and those we are going to discover in the next, only Allah knows, millions of years that are going to come or thousands of years or whatever, yeah? So a virus that is going to exist, let's say, in a hundred thousand years from now. We've got no clue whatsoever what that virus is, what it's going to do, what the name might be, who's going to discover it. Yet Allah knows exactly right now what that virus is. Guess why? Because that virus is already, it exists, we're just not capable of finding it. But Allah knows, and it is in a collection of events. Remember the, the, the meaning of Kataba? So that virus will exist when a certain environment is favorable for it to exist. It doesn't mean by any stretch of anything that Allah has written our book somewhere and that our actions are in a book and that they are going to happen. It's got nothing to do with that. The next ayah will explain this topic a little bit further and deeper. And it's Surah Yunus alayhi salam. That's Surah number 10. And the ayah is number 61. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, and he talks to us also as well. He says, وَمَا تَكُونُ فِي شَأْنٍ And in whatever matter you are in, وَمَا تَتْلُو مِنْهُ مِنْ قُرْآنٍ And whatever part of the Qur'an you are reading, وَلَا تَعْمَلُونَ مِلْعَمَلٍ And whatever work you are doing, إِلَّا كُنَّا عَلَيْكُمْ شُهُودًا But we are witness on you when you undertake that job. It reads the Qur'an, cooking, doing whatever you do. إِذْ تُفِيضُونَ فِيهِ As you undertake it with vehemence and with uh, energy. And then Allah says, وَمَا يَعْزُبُ عَنْ رَبِّكَ مِنْ مِثْقَالِ ذَرَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ And nothing escapes nor hides from your Lord, not even the weight of an atom. The atom here doesn't mean uh, what we know today, the atom, yeah? To the Arabs before, the smallest animal that they could see with their eyes was the ant. The ant's name was Atom at that time there. But today we have advanced in science and things like that and we found out that the ant is just an ant. Beyond it, there is another world of the unseen, mosquitoes and bacteria and things like that, smaller than the bacteria until we reach the 
atom. And the atom is only a description. It's not a noun because one day we will find out certain other things that are smaller than the atom and they become the atom themselves. Okay? So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and nothing escapes nor hides from your Lord, not even the weight of an atom of dust in the earth or heaven, nor anything lesser or greater except it is in a clarifying book. Again, let us see in what context was this beautiful ayah and what does Allah want to tell us. This is a mind-blowing ayah. It is the spine around which so many ayat that are close to it. It's the spine of those ayat. Uh, here is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And again, we're going to look further beyond this. We're going to see some ayat either before or after to get a good idea. So let us look at that. Allah says, Ya ayyuhannas. Hey people, Allah is talking here to mankind of all times whenever the Quran... You see, Allah is an alive entity. An alive entity's voice or words are alive as long as the person or the, the God here, Allah, is alive, his words are alive. Those words speak to people that are alive. The Quran does not address people that died, does not address people that are not born yet. Al Quran talks to people that are alive today. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhannas, you people. There has come to you an exhortation, a forewarning, i.e. the Qur'an here, from your Lord. And a healing for what is in your beliefs, in your hearts. Okay? And then he says, And a guidance, again the Qur'an is a book of guidance, and a book of mercy to the believers. And then Allah says in the ayah number 58, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ Say with the bounty of Allah and with His mercy that the Qur'an exists with us today. فَلْيَفْرَحُوا Let them be happy about it. هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ It is better than all the riches that they accumulate. And this is why Rasulullah one day said, if one of you goes to the masjid or studies one ayah of Allah and understand it, it is better than collecting all the beauties of the world. And this, that hadith is an explanation or in reference to this ayah here, that you enjoy the Qur'an is far better than any wealth that you amass. Of course, you, you gotta go work, you gotta do your best to become the most rich person on earth. And when you reach the highest of what you can reach to becoming rich, studying one ayah is better than what you have amassed. It's beautiful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul, say, Ya Muhammad, again we have that say. أَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ بِالْرِزْقِ Do you see the risk, the sustenance, all that you got, that Allah has sent down to you? فَجَعَلْتُمْ مِنْهُ حَرَامًا وَحَلَالًا And then of that risk, you, the people that Allah is talking to you, you made some of it haram and the other one halal. And you hear this a lot, Coca-Cola is haram. Wearing that kind of color is haram. Uh, doing something to your face is haram shaving your beard is haram people are too easy with this terminology of haram or halal and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks them questions those people who make coca-cola haram or whatever it is uh, haram Allah says قُلْ أَلَّهُ أَذِنَ لَكُمْ it is say to them is it really Allah that has given you the permission to do that i.e. of all what Allah has revealed on earth and then you decide out of your own pocket to make certain things haram and certain things halal tell them is it Allah that has given you the authority to do that am Allah taftarun or is it that you forge lies against Allah and then Allah says, وَمَا ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ So what do those who fabricate lies against Allah expect on judgment today? إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى النَّاسِ Indeed, Allah is ever bountiful to mankind for not punishing them now. 
ولكن أكثرهم لا يشكرون yet most of them are ingrate they are ungrateful and to eliminate any ill thoughts from the minds of those who don't believe in Allah all the Muslims who believe in Allah yet they take the authority in their hands to classify certain things haram out of their own whims or what they believe in or whatever and make other things haram Allah wanted what Allah really wanted to tell them is that Allah did not make many things that the Muslims themselves make haram or the Jews or the Christians and that when he did not make them uh, halal or haram and he left them as they are halal for us you see if you are walking in the street and you find or you are in the jungle and you find an animal the, the initial thought in your mind is that animal is halal except what Allah has mentioned in the Quran and this is scholars like Imam Malik and many others they say any animal on earth is halal to eat except what Allah has prohibited in the Quran the pork and the blood and what Allah has prohibited uh, in the Quran anyhow so here and then Allah tells them وَمَا تَكُونُ فِي شَأْنٍ وَمَا تَتْلُو مِنْهُ مِنْ قُرْآنٍ In whatever conditions or need you are in and whatever portion of the Qur'an you recite therein and whatever work you uh, quickly and eagerly all do we are present before you i.e. with you when you, in, you are engaged in doing it nothing is ever distant يَعْزُبُ <laughs> Azaba, that means far off. That's why somebody who is not married, you say Azab. Azab meaning is far off from marriage. So nothing is ever distant from Allah, even to the measure of a particle on the earth or in the heavens. And there is nothing smaller or greater that is not in a clear book i.e. Al-Imam al mubin The clear book is where the actions of humans are recorded. i.e. don't think for a split of a second if Allah has not classified something as haram that he forgot. Absolutely not. Allah is with us all the time. He knows what we're doing. He knows what humans will do. And whatever he wanted to make haram, he made it haram and it was clear there. But whatever you do now, it is in a book. Nothing is ever amid that's why on judgment day all your deeds you will find them in the book the, uh, that's why in Surah Zalzala whoever does an atom weight of a good deed and remember an atom is subjective depending on where we are you will see it subhanallah and again whoever does an atom weight of vile evil they will see it that's this ayah means exactly that the last part of the Quran uh, what they call Juz Amma is nothing else but a summary of the whole Quran or if you will it's the reference titles to the whole Quran so when you see that Allah says that all the actions of people will be weighed to the atoms degree then whenever you read in the Quran you must read it with this understandings it's got nothing to do with our deeds now off to the ayah uh, number 51 from Surah At-Tawbah. Surah At-Tawbah is 9. And Surah At-Tawbah is the last of what was revealed at the life of Rasulullah Wasallam. And this, I hear this all the time. This ayah greatly misused. Uh, La ilaha illallah. قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا Say nothing will afflict us except what Allah has decreed for us. هو مولانا he is our protector وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون and let the believers then put all their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a very misunderstood ayah that people use a lot and anyone who wants to and, and got in conversations with people the moment they want to prove that everything that's going to befall us is already written on us they would use this ayah now this ayah okay we, along with Surah At-Tawbah was revealed in Al-Madinah because of what the hypocrites have caused to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
When the Prophet ﷺ was getting ready to go out and meet in battle an army that was marching on Al Madinah from the north, okay, from the Byzantines at that time there, the hypocrites did all they could to discourage the believers to go out and meet the said army. The hypocrites used a variety of tricks and excuses and did their very best to feed these techniques to the believers, hoping that the believers would turn away from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Back in time for your information, uh, uh, what they used to do was this. Muslims, we did not have a dedicated army like countries today have today a recruited army. The, their job is be a soldier. Back in time, at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu until came the time of Muawiyah who started this kind of things armies were based on voluntarily like you, you volunteer to go fight Okay, so that moment there because everything was volunteer and the, the hypocrites did their job so that as little as possible of the believers would volunteer with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this surah. لَقَدْ اِبْتَغَوُ الْفِتْنَةَ مِنْ قَبْلِ Those hypocrites, they already sought to spread discord before and devised every possible plot against you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَلَّبُوا لَكَ الْأُمُورِ حَتَّى جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَظَهَرَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ وَهُمْ كَارِيُونَ Until the truth came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the will of Allah prevailed much to their dismay. They hated that, but it happened. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries on. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ اِذَنْ لِي وَلَا تَفْتِنِّي And some of them, they say, Ya Allah Muhammad, اِذَنْ لِي Give me permission not to go with you. Some of those hypocrites, they actually had the guts to go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask him directly, give me permission mission so that I don't go with you to fight. Why? They say because don't put me into trial. Don't be, some of them even believed or not. They went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and he said this. Ya Rasulullah of course in the best of ways I am a man who has a weakness for white red haired beautiful women and the Byzantines have this kind of women. If I go with you to fight them I will be tempted to fornicate with these blonde girls so please allow me to stay in Al-Madinah and I don't go out with you. You see what excuses to what level of subhanAllah baseness they went. But that is uh, how they do it. That's why they say some of them uh, tifteni, do not put me into fitna trouble. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with that kind of speech they already have fallen inside fitna tribulation. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Wa inna jahannam la muhitatun bil kafirin. And very Jahannam on Judgment Day shall surround the disbelievers. And then Allah says, If a blessing, a goodness happens to you, reaches you, that will grieve them. And if a calamity or a disaster strikes you, and what will they, what will the hypocrites say? They will say, "Qad akhazna amrana min qabl." We have taken our precaution before, and today that disaster didn't hit us; it didn't reach us. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa yatawalla wa hum farihun," and then they would turn away, and they are all happy with their decision. And then Allah says, "Qul ya Muhammad, tell these people." لا يصيبنا إلا ما كتب الله لنا. Tell them nothing will afflict us except what Allah has decreed for us. هو مولانا. He is our protector. وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون. I.e. Let the believers put their trust on Allah. What this ayah means. قل لا يصيبنا إلا ما كتب الله لنا. Say nothing will happen to us except that which Allah has written for us, not on us. What this ayah means is that nothing that Allah hasn't created will ever strike us. The wrong belief comes in is they say, قُلْ لَيْ يُصِيبَنَا Nothing will happen to us except what Allah has written for me. And you think like what's written in your book of deeds is you not, nothing is going to hit you except what Allah has already decreed for you. It doesn't mean this at all. Because the ayah says, قُلْ لَيْ يُصِيبَنَا in a group form, not لَيْ يُصِيبَنِي hits me, it's hit us. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was talking to the other people as an army. i.e. nothing is going to happen to us except مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا In Arabic, كَتَبَ عَلَيْكَ It's against you. 
Okay? For example, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam. The siyam has been written on you. Not kutiba lakum as-siyam. Kataba laka is you get something good coming to you. Kataba alayk, it always is a responsibility. It's always something that you don't like. That's why we don't like fasting. It's because we don't like it, okay? So here it's like you say, this is for you. This is against you. So here it says, قُلْ لَا يُصِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا And لَنَا is positive. Not عَلَيْنَا Which is negative. So what Allah is saying, let me ask you a question here. Uh, death. How many possibilities humans can die with? I'm just going to make it simple, yeah? I'm going to say 1,000 possibilities that Allah has written in the book of laws, in the collection of death. Okay, remember the chapter of death, the collection, how a human can possibly die. And in that, Allah includes 1,000 possibilities. My question to you is this. Can you die with 1,001 death, that death over 1,000? You can't. Because Allah only decreed 1,000. And if I tell you, oh, you are going to die with a death, but that death is ranked one after the 1,000. You're not going to be able to die. Let me give you another example. Let's say diseases. Allah has created uh, 9,000 9, diseases. And all humans, whatever we humans are going to fall uh, uh, sick with, is going to be one of these 9,000 diseases. Can we fall sick with a disease that is not in these 9,000 diseases? We will not. So what Rasulullah what Allah is telling his messenger to tell to the other people is that whatever calamity that we might encounter in our life is something that Allah has written on all humanity and whoever fulfills the condition for that calamity, it shall befall them. That's all there is to it. What Allah has written on humanity, that is what, what, death? We're going to die, then what's the deal? A kind of like die with the possibility 500 and that is have my head decapitated, cut from my body? That's what's going to happen. So this ayah is what it's saying that, that when Allah, when something good happens to you, it's something good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you and it will not please them they will just feel uh, it will grieve them and then if something of what Allah has written in the bigger picture happens to you that's what has happened it's, it's, you see it's not it doesn't the ayah doesn't say قُلْ لَيُّ صِبَنِي nothing's gonna happen to me except what Allah has written for me no it speaks about humanity and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely extremely precise when he puts the Quran let me go to the ayah number 7 and this is in Surah Fatir and Surah Fatir is the Surah number 35 and the ayah is 11 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ And Allah created you from dust. ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ Then from a drop of sperm. ثُمَّ جَعَلَكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا Then he made you into pears. وَمَا تَحْمِلُ مِنْ أُنْثَى وَلَا تَضَعُوا إِلَّا بِعِلْمِهِ And no female conceives nor delivers a child except with his knowledge, i.e. the knowledge of Allah. وَمَا يُعَمَّرُ مِنْ مُعَمَّرٍ and no one's life is made longer or cut short in the English translation they say is written in a book but Allah says is in a book there is no verb right and then Allah says you see every time Allah brings this uh, matters in a book that is always at the end Allah answers it that is certainly very easy for Allah most of the books of tafsir and translations either openly say that the book is the preserved tablet or add the word written or recalled in a book, which goes back to the preserved tablets. You see, in either way, it's either preserved tablets or go back with and use the right to go back to the preserved tablets. But in reality, all what Allah is telling us is that all that happens to us from our creation from dust 
to us going back to dust and all the stages in between birth and then either long or short life all these all that happens to us follows a law that Allah has somewhere with him it doesn't mean that our sexes were predetermined do you remember the hadith of Rasulullah when he says there is a report they say if the water of the man tops the water of the woman it's a boy if the water of the female tops that of the man it's a girl do you remember that well that is the book of law what the woman conceives of if it is boy or a girl for example in another hadith that Rasulullah says who, uh, 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 whoever likes that his risk becomes big and his life becomes longer let him be good to his parents okay and then here how come uh, being good to the parents and doing good uh, enhances our lives well guess what it really is simple because how many years you are going to live have not been decided at all forget that hadith that says that the angel comes I will, I will deal that, uh, with that later on when it comes to the creation has Allah really written how many years you are going to live absolutely not how many years you are going to live is not yet decided but so isn't that something amazing here is why in Al-Quran if someone kills somebody else okay let me put it out there, yeah if I kill you the listener I kill you I, I am the assassin you're the victim what's gonna happen to me I'm gonna be killed by the book of Allah and nafsu bin nafsi and this is also in the children of Israel this is in Christianity and this is in Islam and elsewhere in the world they always apply a murderer uh, gets the death penalty but the question is why do you kill me if I am executing if Allah for example yeah, if Allah has written that your age is 25 and I kill you at 25 all I have done is carried the will of Allah so why am I blamed because he wrote you're gonna die 25 and he wrote that you're gonna be assassinated and he wrote that the assassin is gonna be me so if I go to the court of law I'm gonna say look this is what Allah has written and all I did is carried the will of Allah would anyone accept that? Would you accept that if someone killed your child and brought this uh, thinking and this excuse? Would you accept it from them? Of course you would not. Of course you would not. You would want the, the harshest of ways for that person to die executed on that person. And it's the truth. Here is why. Because any human on earth, their life is not decided as yet. So when someone comes and shortens when the assassin comes and shortens the life of the person when I come and shorten your life then I deserve that my life be shortened as well and this is why I get killed as well I shortened your life you shorten my the, the, the law or justice system shortens my life this is exactly what Allah says the hadith and all that kind of stuff and I will see all the other ayahs or things like that you have to understand them with this context okay if Allah in the Quran says gold's color is yellow and then wherever you find the term yellow that speaks about a precious metal all you gotta do is replace that yellow with gold and that's how it works in Al-Quran so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us from dust and then the next stage was the drop of sperm and then he made us into prayer into pairs so that the male and female get married and then the, who conceives is the female and then who delivers the child is the female all that happens with the knowledge of Allah why because Allah put the laws of that to happen and no one's life is made long or short Who, who's gonna make it you make your life long or short if you want to die young go get extremely fat and keep eating the way <laughs> the way people die young and you will die young go abuse on heroin and you will die young jump out of a cliff and you have shortened your life with your hands so that's what it is or you work hard and you work hard, you go to the gym and you eat properly and 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 you extend your life none your life is not decided as yet all those laws that you use to stay 
for longer life or shorter life, all these already exist in a book, and that book is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, written, the laws, the book of laws. I, this is where the Quran stops and I will try inshallah uh, to stop here and next talk I will do about with the hadith this way we keep the Quran by itself and the hadith by itself so my dear sisters and my brothers I wanted to understand something we Muslims today will live in a world of confusion that world of confusion is mainly due because we forced some understandings on the Quran on the book of Allah the culture has played an unbelievable amount of injustice injustice on the Quran believe it or not the way the Quran talks is absolutely beautiful the way we get married we're not doing it according to the Quran we're doing it according to culture according to tribes according to the saints of the scholars for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran beautifully puts it Allah talks about a vow a, a mithaq is a covenant that we give and take from our each other a, a husband does that to the woman the woman does that to the man the Christians apply this law and maybe the Jews as well but we Muslims you don't apply that even though it's in the Quran Allah tells us when you get married do the covenant you know when the, you've seen this in movies when a man and a woman go to the church or the synagogue to get married they exchange vows yeah well the Quran tells us to exchange vows we Muslims must exchange vows but guess what have you ever heard of a Muslim exchanging vows with their partner no never we never do that I don't know why even though the Quran is clear the Quran my dear sisters and my brothers talks to us a beautiful language Muslims are so used to hardship in their religion Muslims are so used to extremes in their religion Muslims are so used to abuse in their religion but when we start with an ayah from the Quran and it makes things simple we doubt Al-Quran Wallahi Al-Azim we doubt Al-Quran we don't accept Al-Quran at all because it's just it's not in a what I'll take an example yeah Took, taking a ghusl from Janabah it's either you have a wet dream or you slept with your partner okay and you ejaculate sperm came out okay that's it and it's time for you to go and take ghusl I get a lot of people asking me what is the correct sunnah way of doing ghusl and I tell them the correct way to make your ghusl take your shampoo with you take your body wash with you go inside the shower and take a shower and that's that and, and people what the, the, that how about uh, if I have uh, I forgot them the, the, the ponytails and pigtails and all that how do I uh, pigtails and how do I do that do I open them I say no just keep them as they are and take a shower as you would or just go jump in a swimming pool or for that matter in the ocean or if you want to have a garden pool go jump on it and that's it people can't accept this because they are so used to complication get get in the shower first of all you want to make you wash your private parts as if when you take a shower they're not gonna get washed but anyhow wash your private parts and then make your wudu and don't wash your feet leave them until you have washed the entire body what a bunch of nonsense yeah he, why because the scholars made you believe this is the right path to doing sunnah it's got nothing to do with that it's got nothing to do with that at the time of rasulullah and even now in some parts of the world if you take a shower in the open where you don't have a shower where the, you've got the where the water just runs free on earth then when you take a shower notice that when you finish your shower your feet are dirty because they are muddy and guess what then the scholars, the scholars they say you wash your feet just to make sure you clean them wear your shoes and leave that has a meaning because they I'm, I'm taking a shower on the dust you know on the on the land and I get muddy yes I understand that but in the shower to keep copying something that doesn't exist it makes us completely idiots you know if you go on the internet on YouTube and you type uh, idiots at work you, you laugh your tail off because people are really idiots when they do certain jobs we Muslims have this knack of 
making simple things extremely difficult. Even though Allah in the Quran says to Rasulullah Sallallahu we have not revealed the Quran unto you, ya Muhammad, and unto us because we follow the Quran so that we become extreme, we have, we live in hardship. Allah in the Quran says, ma alaykum fi min haraj. Allah has not made for you in Al Islam anything that is of a difficulty, hardship for you. Muslims today will live 99% of our thing on our in, in hardship and difficulties. Why? Because the man of religion invented one rule and that rule became like the Lord of the Ring to rule us all. And what is that rule? Is Darul Mafsada. And what they mean by this is this. Warding off corruptions or evil or violence takes precedence over bringing benefit. If we have two situations and one of them will bring evil and the same situation will bring good. And then they will tell you, no, that situation that brings evil takes precedence over the good. So that means they forbid something that Allah has not forbidden. And this is the Islam we live in today. Those who are today the warriors and the knights of such an understanding is what's today called the Salafi. Salafis are nothing else but the promoters of all and anything that stands of Al-Quran, against the Quran at least to an 80% degree because 99% of their belief relies on the hadith, the sayings of the scholars. Listen to any Salafi start their talk, they always start, Qala Rasulullah. X, Y said, uh, the messenger said, and things like that. Hardly ever you will find them mentioning, uh, I'm going to say, five ayat of the Quran. Never. It's all, and if they mention one ayah of the Quran, they always follow it up with the sayings of the scholars until the ayah has no meanings at all. And I will close my talk by saying this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed unto Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Hajjat al-Wada' in the year he made the final Hajj, al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. Today I have completed for mankind, talking here to mankind as a whole, Jews, Christians, everybody, Hare Krishna, Buddha, all people, Allah tells them today I have completed your religion, i.e. the Islam that is accepted for uh, uh, in the sight of Allah, in the deen, in the law, Islam, the religion, the Islam, the belief behind it is being completed. That's one in the Quran. Allah is one of these like that, yeah? But anyway, and I have fulfilled my bounty upon you. And I am pleased that Al-Islam, not the, the Islam that you and I believe in, okay, that is part of the big Islam. Uh, I will speak about this later on when I talk about the meanings of Islam in Al-Quran, the three meanings uh, that our scholars hold. But you know, would you believe it that if you go to the books of tafsir, you will find scholars of tafsir and scholars of fiqh and hadith, they disagree about the meaning of this simple to understand ayah. And that's where our problem is. So what do we take from the ayat, the seven ayat is this. Allah has not written on any human being what any human being would do. Allah has written the rules and the laws that if anyone follows these rules and the laws, they will get to that result. And if you do take other rules and ways, you will get to another result. In, when I will not speak about the knowledge of Allah. I will leave that until later on about the Mashiach, the will of Allah. When I talk about Allah's knowledge and how and how does Allah, where does Allah stand between you and the actions you do? Okay. So, for example, you wake up in the morning. What you are going to wear? Has Allah written that? Of course not. But does Allah know what you are going to wear? Yes. But you have 900 pieces of clothes. So there are 900 possibilities as to what you are going to wear. So does Allah favor one probability over the others? I will leave this to when I speak about the will of Allah. The next inshallah portion, the part number four of this talk will be just about the hadith and uh, the discrepancies that exist and why uh, the Quran is the book to go in the primary function of everything that you stand for. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanif and I pray to Allah 
that you understand what I'm trying to convey here and if not do get back to me and I'll do my very best maybe I'm not doing a good job at bringing the news to you but please uh, if something is clumsy do get back to me and I'll be more than happy to explain further okay but take with you Allah has not written on you what you are going to do or when you are going to die your life is in your hands do with it as you please because on judgment day Allah will ask you about your choices not what he has forced on you your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa my telephone number again 0787640 and till next part uh, remain in the mercy of Allah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah